Good afternoon, everyone. And if you're in another time zone, good morning uh, or a very good evening to you all. This is a session on inferential reading strategies for secondary school. In this session, we will look at some pre-work for reading, stages of reading and comprehension, inferential strategies, of course, and critical response to questions. Before we actually start reading with students, there is a lot of pre-work to be done. And developing proficient reading skills, of course, is essential, not just for English, but for all subjects, because our students take most of their exams in English. This is also a skill that stays with them beyond their academic life. So what is pre-reading? Well, when we look at um, pictures, like the kind that you see on the screen, students can gather a lot of information from it. If you notice the facial expressions, um, of this man, this utter ecstasy at looking at a banknote. And um, if you encourage your students to observe closely, read the facial expressions, and understand a character's feelings, or just by looking at their demeanor, uh, get into a critical reflection or analysis process of talking about what they may be like, this is really the first step to gathering clues and reasoning that are required for inferential reading. There are lots of inferential reading strategies incorporated in our Oxford Progressive English first edition book for secondary school students. It has an integrated approach to ELT with follow-up activities, hands-on learning that you can use even in your online lessons. There's extensive focus on grammar, vocabulary, and punctuation, which is reinforced as students go along and taught really through usage than in discrete ways. There's multi-sensory learning tools that teachers um, can get a lot of support from and assessment for learning, because really we don't want to wait till the end of the year to help those students who might be reluctant readers or struggling readers and assessment for learning strategies in the book at the end of each unit help you understand exactly where the student might be in relation to the benchmarks that you have set for them. There's a lot of support for teachers in our teaching guides with supplementary tests, especially for those students who are up for bigger challenges, the ones who are fast learners and pick up very quickly and might be up for more work than you've set for the rest of the class. And of course, there are end of year tests that teachers don't really have to prepare because they're all given to them in the teaching guides. And also um, lesson plans and breakups of the lessons for help with timing. So these are the secondary school books for um, classes six and above. The teaching guides for books nine and 10 are combined. And um, the reason for that is to help with the progression from class nine to class 10. Reading and comprehension really incorporates engagement, decoding, analysis, and response. In a sense, it's a cycle where we want to uh, give students a sort of hook to engage them in the lessons. If they're not involved in reading, if they're not curious enough to explore and to discover on their own, then chances are that they might become reluctant readers. It's not very easy to help them learn if they're not engaged in the process. So what kind of engagement activities can we really involve them in? Well, a lot of it has to do with how we structure the discussion in the classroom, what kind of questions we ask them, and how we help them contribute to the class. Because speaking skills and speaking fluency is fluency in speaking is the first step to fluency in reading so when students get lots of opportunity to speak up in class and present their ideas and perhaps exchange ideas with one another brainstorm as it were before they actually read a text that really helps them get engaged and involved involved in an immersive learning process Next comes the step of decoding, where we introduce the text to them in um, and break it up into tasks that are easy for them to handle so that they can decode information with a step-by-step -step approach rather than um, in, a, in a plateful of um, 
rice, for example, if you give them a plate full of rice, it might be very hard for them to down it at one go. But if you break it up into bites, it's much easier to handle. Reading is kind of like that as well. And those are the strategies that we will discuss as we go along. The role of analysis and critical thinking is really important in the reading process. And that really is what leads them towards the responses that you're looking for and the student learning outcomes that you're targeting for them. The stages of a reading lesson include a preview before reading where we brainstorm with the children, where we give them a title and ask them to predict what it might be all about. So let me give you an example. If your topic is um, about earthquakes, you might want to engage them in a discussion based on the five W's. Where do earthquakes generally take place? What are earthquakes is something you might want to begin with and perhaps discuss um, some other natural disasters as well, some that they might have experienced. So we could link the question to their experiences, ask them to narrate a story or recount a memory. And then from there on, we take them to a discussion about earthquakes and perhaps why they occur, how earthquakes occur, how earthquakes are measured. And when we frame questions for them, what we're really doing is helping them access their prior knowledge. That is an integral part of the pre-reading process. And after they've predicted what the, there might be in that text, we could go on to clicking and um, clunking the parts of the text that we want them to focus on. So what do we really do about that? We reread sentences during the reading process. We reread sentences to make sure that we've got all the key points that we're looking for. We would also perhaps look for clues and help students understand that language is not always to be taken at face value. Sometimes sentences have double meaning, sometimes they're multi-layered. And it's really about inferential reading especially, is all about digging deep into the multiple layers of meaning in a sentence. Figurative language is also part of it, which we will discuss further on in this session. In terms of vocabulary, you might want to target particular words and pre-teach them through an elicitation process, perhaps a snowball activity. And sometimes it's helpful to look for a root word and think about its prefix or add a suffix to it to make another word or extend the same word, look for synonyms, perhaps think of antonyms for a word. The idea is to get the gist of a text and just perhaps skim it before we get into the details of it. You might want to ask these questions. What is the most important place, person or thing in this text? What is this text really about? It might be a character, it might be an event. Once we've identified the character or the event, we then move on to observing details about what is being said about this character or this event. What is the most important idea that is being shared by the writer? Do you agree with the writer's perspective? Is the writer, writer's or perspective always correct? What other perspectives can we have? So we would then engage students in a process of dialogue, critical thinking, collaboration with each other where, we, where they exchange ideas, perhaps argue against each other in a structured and logical way, also learn to defend their own arguments and back what they're saying with evidence and examples from the text. And then we have a wrap up activity where we might want to scan the text for particular information that we're looking for and do a few extended tasks where we focus on the punctuation in the text and extend our vocabulary given the word pool in the Oxford Progressive English books. Back to pre-reading. So here are some of the steps for pre-reading. Once we introduce a text, we want to hook the students first with a hypothetical situation. So you know the situation as a teacher, you know what you're introducing to them. You might want to take a step back, stop and uh, give them, phrase it or frame it within the context of a hypothetical situation and 
ask them, what would you do in this situation? What you're really doing is pushing the boundaries of their imagination at this point and helping them think about the text before they've even read it. So that's how we create a context for what we're going to present next. And then we start talking about, and I'll give an example of a context. Visuals help greatly with creating context as well. So if you have a um, word such as emergency relief, the, the students might not know what emergency relief means and you might not want to give a definition and explain it because by itself, it might not make any sense. But if you frame it within the context of um, refugee life or famine in some part of the world and, and ask them what, you think they will require, what the students come up with is actually going to be the same as emergency relief. They're just not using that word. So that's how you would lead them up to the concept of emergency relief. The other way to do it is to present a picture. That's really the quickest way to help them visualize what is being spoken about. And of course, we can work through the vocabulary that is in the text. You know the targeted vocabulary. As a teacher, you know what vocabulary you're targeting. You might want to lead them up to that as well by eliciting those words in advance. So an example would be um, the word excruciating. If, you, if it's sitting in the student's passive vocabulary because they've obviously heard it at some point or seen it on TV, or read it somewhere, but they don't know what that word really means, you might want to give them an example with a sentence to contextualize that word for them and tell them, um, I've suffered excruciating pain in my knee in the last few um, weeks. They will definitely come up with the word serious or severe or very bad or extreme. And then you could have as many words as possible coming in also ask them for antonyms then the opposites of those words. You can do this elicitation with just about any word in the text and you can do it using the word pool that's already given. Once you contextualize the words for them, it becomes much easier for them to retain the meaning of those words and perhaps be able to use them in sentences themselves because what you're really doing is bringing that word from the passive, passive vocabulary into their active usage. Prediction works through a process of brainstorming where they tell you all that they can about a topic in terms of how they've experienced it, what they think about it, whether they have an opinion on it. And then we move on to key points with a question formulation technique where they will look at a title Going back to the example of the earthquake, you might want to ask them um, to write down as many questions as possible about the earthquake. So what do they really want to know about earthquakes? And you'd be surprised how many questions they really come up with. So this is not a situation where the teacher is asking the questions, but prior to reading, you might want to ask them to jot down as many questions as they can. This is the process where you're building curiosity. You bring them to a point where they actually want to read the text. They get involved in the, the topic um, as deeply as possible before you give them the text. And you can do this in online teaching as well through the chat box where they get to formulate their own questions. They, get to write as many as possible in the chat box just to show what they want to learn about earthquakes and this can be done just about with just about any topic and next we move on to targeting the text where when we begin reading we will give them certain questions to think about some food for thought and then we come to reading and decoding texts through a think pair share activity where they get to read to each other rather than reading aloud in class. Some students delight in reading aloud in class. Others are quite shy, but they'll be happy reading to their peers, um, you know, in a pair activity, one-on-one uh, -on -one to the person sitting next to them. Some students like to read in groups. You can also do a jigsaw reading activity where you divide the class into groups of three or four really small groups, not very large ones, so that everyone gets a chance to read. And then each group's 
each group gets one paragraph from the text so that when they summarize what they've read, then the whole text comes together really well, as it were. If it's a lengthy text, it works really well to cover it in a short 45 minute lesson. And that's where we introduce the idea of inference, the hidden meaning in certain sentences. Inference really is something that is not stated overtly, but has to be understood by the readers. It is the writer's perspective. It is all those things that the writer wants to show us, but is not telling us explicitly. And of course, for inference to be taught successfully, you would need to target the vocabulary first and have them understand it in context before we can actually move on. And then we move on to studying the text closely, decoding it uh, bit by bit, looking for the key information, asking each other questions based on the five W's again, which I keep coming back to because they're so, so important in critical thinking and analysis. Here's an example of an inferential reading text. So we've got um, Red Dog and the title is Belonging. When we talk about belonging, we might want to think about, um, we might want to think about an individual's role in society. Where do we belong? How do we belong? What helps our belonging? What obstructs our belonging? what kind of people belong in their environment and are accepted in their environment or are able to adapt to their environment. When they read this text about Red Dog, they could be asked, you might want to ask them to observe Red Dog closely for his behavior and his emotions. He's rather quirky and there are eccentric people all over. It also gives students a perspective into different kinds of people the non-conformist uh, ones really. And this is a really interesting and engaging text about how Red Dog chases people for car rides. And those he asks for lifts from get rather sick of him and they start avoiding Red Dog. Now this is a pattern in his behavior that might be found in um, the behavior of certain people in your students' lives, and you might want to discuss that as well. Well, the first step towards inference and understanding characters and being able to analyze characters is to look closely at their emotions. How are they feeling and what is making them behave the way they're behaving? And then look at different aspects of their behavior. What is acceptable in society and what is not acceptable and why? Those questions of why and how are really important in digging deep into the student's thought process and having them come out and share their individual opinions and ideas. And then the other people's reactions to Red Dog are really quite interesting because you might want to stop at this point and ask the students, what is it about Red Dog's behavior that is evoking certain reactions in the people around him? What impact can we make or what impact can our behavior make? on the people around us. So there's a, a great deal of analysis of Red Dog that can be done through this passage. The reason why I've selected this particular one is to show you that for inferential reading strategies, it's very important to study characters closely because that is really where students get a chance to observe closely and analyze um, the, the depth and detail of emotions and behavior. If it's an event, then they will analyze it from all perspectives, including how people have reacted to that event. For vocabulary development, as you read with students, you might want to keep reinforcing the words that are already used in the text. And in the Oxford Progressive English books, there are patterns of words that keep reappearing so that that sort of gets embedded in the student's memory. They don't actually have to memorize words or word lists. They will learn them through usage, through the sentences, or if the teacher gives them examples and demonstrates how those words are used in context. It's also important to enunciate um, for the students. So even if they're older students, they're in secondary school and they can read for themselves, sometimes it's important for the teacher to read bits of the text 
out loud to the class to teach them enunciation, intonation, and volume control. Elicitation is uh, an activity that we've already discussed um, a couple of minutes ago. I just want to stop here and point out that a snowball activity works brilliantly with elicitation where students are given a word such as beautiful. And if you stop and you um, ask them to think about synonyms for beautiful, they will come up with some words if you give them a sentence and contextualize the word for them or give them a situation. You talk about the mountains that are beautiful, or you could talk about rivers and trees that are beautiful, something that's great to look at, and have them come up with, um, or a human being who's beautiful, and have them come up with words such as attractive, stunning, gorgeous, breathtaking, mesmerizing. When they have a list of words that they have exchanged between them, or they just individually come up with these words in the classroom, or in online teaching, you can use the chat box. The chat box can really be kept very busy um, if you conduct an elicitation sort of activity with your students. And they will come up with these words themselves. They could write them down on a piece of paper, crumple it into a snowball. It's really quite satisfying that crushing sound that they get when they crumple a snowball. In class, they can throw it at each other. It doesn't hurt but they get to exchange words like that. So they get someone else's snowball, they open it and they get to read words that they might not know. And then they can take it home and do the same thing with adults in the house. They could ask them for more synonyms to add to that word list, bring it back to class. And that snowball activity can keep continuing and you can change words every day as well. This is a very short activity. You can do it at the start of a class. You can do it in the middle or towards the end of a class. But this is something you can continue throughout the term with students. And it works really well with online teaching as well because they it gives them something to do while they're um, uh, contributing to to the class. Not every student is great at contributing verbal answers. Some of them love writing, some of them love activity work. And that's how you can create a word pool through peer facilitation. Sometimes students will enjoy role play. So if there is a situation given in the text, ask them to reenact it. They can do this in online lessons very well. It keeps them engaged. And when they reenact a situation, they tend to remember it. Once you have a pair of students or a group of students reenacting or doing some kind of role play for the others in the class, you can also then ask the others to comment on their acting, comment on their verbal skills, comment on their hand gestures. So you're teaching enunciation and at the same time, you're framing questions based on that story that they have just acted out. Students love being dramatic and they love teachers that are animated. So bringing in a bit of drama, even a bit of wackiness in your lessons might really be very engaging for your students. If you have any questions so far, I would love to take them. If you could put your questions down in the chat box or your comments, that'd be great. I would also be very interested to know what particular challenges you face as a secondary school teacher teaching English language skills. And um, towards the end of the session, when we have our Q&A, then we can discuss some of these questions and comments that are coming in the chat box. The, one of the most integral things for inferential reading skills is higher order thinking. And inference can also be taught through dialogue. What one person says to another tells us a lot about how they think and how they feel. So identifying those particular language techniques um, uh, that help us with understanding a situation or a character or an event that is being discussed will show you the process that that character is going through and the multiple meanings of words as well, whether they're saying something literally or they're saying something figuratively. At the secondary school level, it's very important for students to understand that language is not always literal, that we can have a play upon words, that we can manipulate words strategically to have an impact on other people. And that facility with the English language, that facility to play with words, comes with an understanding that words 
can have double meanings or multiple meanings. It also helps students conceptualize different situations. So if you've given them a story or a text to read, you might want to ask them to retell it in their own individual ways. Can they think of a different outcome for this story? If a particular character's behavior changes, how will the outcome of the story change? How will it impact other people differently? Or if there's an event that you're discussing, you might want to talk about, or a viewpoint, you might want to talk about how that viewpoint can change. You might want to ask students to write a sequel to the story or the text that they've just read. And then we move on to literal comprehension techniques where you have the question formulation technique. We've already discussed this. This is where the teacher is not asking the questions, but asking the students to come up with questions of their own and as many as possible. Then you would have them identify and reiterate the important bits from the text. So really this is about summarizing the text or paraphrasing it, retelling it in their own words, which is the key points and leaving out all the irrelevant details. Here you're teaching the students to select the information that is important because of course, this is going to be significant in their ability to handle the tasks at the end of a text or a unit. Help them con con conceptualize a different outcome, a different structure to the story, a different character, give a little twist to what is being discussed. These are all questions that you're asking them as you go along through a process of discussion and even debate and arguments in class. The SQ3R technique is a technique I'd like to discuss in some detail because it is um, uh, perhaps one of the most effective techniques to enable students to handle their comprehension tasks at the end of the unit. So the S stands for survey, which is surveying the text. And how do we survey it? Through a process of skimming and scanning. We move on to, then we move on to questions. Again, these are questions that the students are making for themselves because they want to understand what they will learn or what they want to learn from the text. And then the three R's stand for recitation revise and recall, where they learn to read. If they read aloud, they tend to remember the key points and they will then revise, which means they will go through um, the text again to select all the key information that is required. And then they will uh, recall that information for the questions at the end of the unit. So this is what SQ3R really stands for. What do I hope to learn from this text? When you take them through the pre-reading um, process, they will already be in a position to write down as many questions as they can think of pertaining to the text. And then they start looking for answers to their own questions. And they will most likely find the answers to their own questions. The questions that they find at the end of the unit will be quite similar to the ones that they framed for themselves. And then you um, might want to ask them, what is it that you want to remember from this text? Now, very often teachers ask this question that has just come in, in the chat box. It's a very interesting question. Thank you for asking that. So this question says, uh, to what extent is it, um, to what extent is it wise to um, translate from English to Urdu? The thing is that if we start teaching English in the native language, if you translate everything, then there is a certain amount of dependence that gets created and students might really not be able to handle the language without translation. So, um, so I would say that translation might not be a great idea because English has to be taught in English. However, some scaffolding with the native language is always a good idea to demonstrate concepts in class. I hope that answers your question. The last step in SQ3R is recall. So that's when we recall all the important information and an effective way of doing that is through summarizing the key points, summarizing what they have read. I'd like to go through some examples of inference at this point. So we've got um, 
from book seven, unit five, page 115, we have the title danger. What kind of danger do you think this text is talking about? There might be visuals. We've got some fascinating visuals in the Oxford Progressive English books. And those visuals really support um, teaching because they give the students a very quick overview of what the text might be talking about. And you might want to give them a hypothetical dangerous situation such as a fire in a building or a drowning situation or something like um, an earthquake and ask them if they've been in, in a dangerous situation and whether they'd like to discuss their own story. And then we move on to um, particular inferential techniques such as um, this dialogue here, where did we put our shoes? Wallace was running around in circles blindly. Now Wallace is running around blindly. It's important to consider the behavior of a character in a story and ask the students, why is he running around in circles blindly? What makes us do that? What kind of situation would make a character do that? And then talk about why they might be looking for their shoes. If they're in a dangerous situation and they need to get out of it as quickly as possible, why are they looking for their shoes? There must be a reason for that. Do they have to travel over rough terrain? There will be different answers that you will get. And the idea is to get different answers from students because that is what spurs the critical thinking process. It's not like a one size fits all. Everybody doesn't have to come up with the same answer. There's really no right or wrong answer for critical thinking skills questions. And then the next one is for Pete's sake, run, shouted Harry. Why is Harry so adamant that everyone should run? What does Harry know that everyone else doesn't know? So we've got to observe Harry closely to understand his character and perhaps he's being cleverer than the others. He's intelligent enough to know that there is acute danger and that there is no time to look for shoes. So how are these characters behaving differently? That is something that the students might want to consider. Why was it so important for Harry to shout this out? There's an exclamation mark there. If he's shouting it out, that means there's a certain urgency in his voice. These are things that we need to point out as we go along reading the text with the students. Some inferential reading techniques will include looking for clues. These are clues that we look for. What is it about Harry that is different from the others? What is it in this text that is um, that tells you that helps you reach a certain conclusion. So if students have reached a certain conclusion, if someone has come up with an answer, you might want to encourage them to defend that answer with an argument or evidence from the text or an example. That is when students learn to support what they're saying logically and in an organized manner. And then the higher order thinking skills questions where we want to keep asking them, why do you think this? Or how have you arrived at this conclusion? How do you know this? So if they've picked up clues from the text, you might want to ask them, how do you know this? Um, how did you find this out? And you might be right, but obviously you have a reason to think this way. Why are you think, why, why did you think about this and not that? And then encourage as many original ideas as you possibly can because that really helps students evaluate the information and read the, reach their own conclusions. That's the point at which you want to bring them slowly and progressively to a point where they can draw their own conclusions and their individualistic ones. They've arrived at those conclusions by themselves and that is what really helps them become independent learners rather than those who wait for answers from their peers and just write them down or ask the teacher for um, the answers because they can't come up with the answers themselves. Critical thinking also involves asking students to comment on the style, tone, and language techniques that the writer has used. And of course, if you are looking closely at the punctuation marks, why are there exclamation marks here? Why is there a semicolon used and not a full stop? Why is there a long dash here? Because there is some kind of impact that the writer is intending the writer wants to make a dramatic impact. So there's a long dash before introducing a new idea. Understand the writer's viewpoint, argue against the writer's viewpoint, help students understand that there is more than two or three viewpoints. There could be hundreds of different perspectives. So when we encourage different perspectives, we are really digging deep into their critical thinking skills. And then of course there's analysis where we compare, we contrast, we can compare and contrast different texts, different characters within a text, or we can compare the event that we're reading about with something of our own that we know 
where we're accessing our prior knowledge and building upon it to develop the skills of analysis. And retelling a story is of course really important because that's when the teacher really gets to know whether students have understood what they've read. So inference, um, a quick recap, inference is all about the hidden meaning in texts. There's more than meets the eye. We don't take everything at face value. We've got to dig deep for multiple meanings. The setting will tell us a lot about um, what is coming. So for those of you who have taught Shakespearean plays, you would know that when there is a storm brewing and there's uh, the skies are dark and there are um, uh, wolves howling in the background or the witches are brewing up a spell, there's something dramatic like that happening, then we know that there is going to be something dire, something serious coming up. But then when we have green, blue skies and green trees and birds chirping, then we know um, that gives us a clue or an insight into what the story is going to be all about. So those are clues. The setting can be a clue in itself for inference. It's something that is not explicitly stated, but we can visualize the, um, the sequence of a story just by looking at the setting and how the writer has decided to establish it. And then we identify the feelings of characters because that is really how we understand their emotions. And then we predict their behavior from how we understand their emotions. We can also imagine what a character is going to do based on our own predict predictions, looking at their emotions and feelings. So if you see someone who's been particularly angry, you know they might become aggressive next or then you know that they are going to act a certain way because they're angry. And then, of course, con constantly question um, the students for deeper meanings of words and sentences. Figurative language is a very important part of understanding um, inference. I mean, inferring texts through figurative language. And then, of course, that question, what can happen next? So can they predict, do they know what might happen next in this story? Visuals support learning. A picture is worth a thousand words, as they say. And so that can be used to support, especially the teaching of vocabulary, but also character analysis and a bit of paraphrasing where children get to tell, retell the story in their own words or summarize it as they see it or as they interpret it. And then ask them to defend their opinion with arguments, examples, and evidence from the text and explore characters to develop more curiosity about them. And perhaps they can change characters around or they can develop their own characters as well. I hope you found this uh, session useful. Um, and um, if you have any questions or comments, I will be happy to take them now. Please put all your questions and comments in the chat box. Thank you very much.